गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी वेलकम टू दिल से दिल तक वी आर लाइव फ्रॉम द सिटी ऑफ बैंगलोर टूडे दिस इज डॉक्टर इंद्रनील योर होस्ट फॉर द डे आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू गिव यू इंपॉर्टेंट स्टेटिस्टिक्स इंडियंस फॉल प्रे टू कार्डियोवास्कुलर डिजीज अबाउट टेन ईयर्स अहेड ऑफ द बेस्ट नॉट ओनली दैट इन इंडिया इट इज मोर अलार्मिंग वन पर्सन डाइज ऑफ कार्डियोवास्कुलर डिजीज एवरी थर्टी थ्री सेकेंड्स टू IPCA has launched an initiative to create an awareness among the public so that we can have a healthy heart lifestyle. With Dil Se Dil Tak, we have brought the elite medical fraternity, the top cardiologists of India on a platform so that we can discuss the different aspects of healthy heart. Today we have an elite panel of cardiologists from Bangalore who will shed more light on this, how to lead a healthy life. how to prevent a heart attack and what exactly we do if we actually have a heart attack first we are live from the city of gardens which is bangalore let's start with a video which shows the different aspects of bangalore let's have a look bangalore the capital city of karnataka which was once called the garden city of india the city is known for its parks nightlife and beautiful architectural masterpieces Like Vidhan Sabha, a new Dravidian legislative building. Former royal residences include 19th century Bangalore Palace and Tipu Sultan's Summer Palace, an 18th century teak structure. But today, it's the center of India's high-tech industry, which over a period of time has witnessed a large-scale population migration from various parts of the country due to rapid industrialization, lifestyle changes, diet, air pollution, and stress. Bangalore is witnessing a surge in cases of heart diseases. Today, Bangalore is witnessing a steady stream of young patients, those in the age group of 16 to 40, being admitted with heart attacks. Doctors say they admit about 150 young patients, about eight of whom are below 25 years of age every month. This translates to a minimum of three to four cases every day. Today, to talk on this. We have a panel of renowned cardiologists from Bangalore live on our talk show. They'll say they'll talk. Healthy heart. Wherein they will educate us about what we should do and what we should not do to keep our heart healthy, to which will save us and our loved ones from the menace of heart diseases. So Bangalore has got brought the IT revolution in India. So let's see now whether we can it can actually lead. A, revolution on healthy heart lifestyle in india uh, to discuss uh, more about this we have our first panelist let's introduce him in an eminent personality across india globally he is the professor and head department of cardiology and cardiac electrophysiologist ms ramaya memorial hospital and professor of cardiology msr medical college and teaching hospital bangalore uh, let's welcome first dr v s prakash we'll start with a video Uh, with a message from him let's see the video human body and its complexities fascinates all of us but a young mind got so much fascinated by it that from early years of his life he had decided to devote his entire life in alleviating human suffering through minimal surgical intervention with outcomes which will make his patients enjoy the beauty of life for long presenting to you the journey of a renowned cardiologist whose goal is to set up a state of the art division of cardiac rhythm management and pacing which is of international standards so that he can serve patients from all around the world meet dr v s prakash who currently heads the department of cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology at ms ramaiya memorial hospital in bangalore since 2005 Dr. V. S. Prakash completed his MD in medicine from Bangalore Medical College in 1986, and DM in cardiology from Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, in 1993. Post which, in his pursuit for excellence, Dr. Prakash has obtained many international renowned certifications from globally renowned medical bodies. To name a few, are training and fellowship in advanced cardiac electrophysiology for complex heart rhythm problems. at a veterans general hospital taipei during 1998 and 1999 which laid the foundation for cardiac rhythm related work back in india fellowship 
in SCAI, Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, USA. Fellowship in ACC, American College of Cardiology. Fellowship to ESC, European Society of Cardiology. Dr. Prakash has a wealth of experience and clinical expertise in performing coronary interventions, including complex coronary angioplasties. Dr. Prakash is among the few cardiologists in India who are well versed as primary operator for various arrhythmias, including AVNRT, WPW, to name a few, including all advanced procedures and implants. Highlights of some of the remarkable work he has done in the field of cardiology are Dr. Prakash was first in India to perform catheter based ablation for atrial fibrillation in 1999. Dr. V.S. Prakash has worked at several reputed hospitals in India since 1994. To name a few are consultant cardiologist at Malia and St. Philomena's Hospital since 1994. Dr. Prakash has also served as observer in cardiac clinical electrophysiology at several hospitals in USA and Germany like Brigham's and Women's Hospital, Boston, Massachusetts, USA in year 2000, Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio, USA in year 2000, Grenoet Cardiology Institute, Indianapolis, USA in 1999, St. George Hospital, Hamburg, Germany in 2003, Florida Hospital, Orlando, USA in 2004, Center for Atrial Fibrillation, Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio, USA in 2005, St. Luke's Hospital, Aurora Sinai Hospital, Milwaukee. He had been invited as faculty at various national and international cardiac electrophysiology and pacing meets. To name a few are faculty at Asia Pacific Atrial Fibrillation Symposium held at Seoul, Korea. Faculty at Asia Pacific Cardiac Electrophysiology and Pacing Symposium held at Jakarta. Followed by faculty at ISE Con, Indian Society of Electrocardiology Conference. Then at Asia Pacific Heart Rhythm Meeting in Hong Kong in 2012, Beijing in 2013, Tokyo in 2014, and Melbourne in 2015. He is a life member of many prestigious medical associations like Cardiological Society of India and CSI Bangalore Chapter, Indian College of Electrocardiology. He is also member of Heart Rhythm Society. His articles on cardiology were published in many peer reviewed journals and had been principal investigator in over 15 research activities. To name a few are Ethana study, Bi Relay study, Inspra study and Aristotle study. Dr. V. S. Prakash, apart from being a busy cardiologist, holds a strong passion for good health because he believes that in a healthy body lives a happy mind and he firmly believes health is wealth. In the past, he had been invited as a speaker at various corporates to educate people on how to keep good heart health. Dr. Prakash was awarded the Mahindra and Mahindra Nightingale Award for one of the 10 leading personalities in the field of medicine in 2003. Let's listen to healthy heart message from Dr. V. S. Prakash. Uh, hi viewers, I am uh, Dr. V. S. Prakash, uh, Head of Cardiology at uh, Ramaya Memorial Hospital. And uh, my message to the to the the population of the people would be to take care of their health primarily in the form of prevention because whatever we do today is we are only chasing the problem rather than taking the bull by the horn I think the best way to take care of your health would be to inculcate healthy lifestyle regular exercise proper diet most importantly avoid smoking avoid fast foods which is really bad today which has become the uh, the way of life for all the youngsters and sedentary lifestyle is something and I'm also concerned about you must have uh, routinely been seeing that people suddenly collapse they're sitting they're watching a TV or they're reading a newspaper and within seconds they are dead and gone this is what we call a sudden death and usually it occurs because of cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac uh, stoppage of the heart functioning this is something that is a big problem that is going on in the world and at the present moment we are still not able to get over this issue find out who are at risk and really try and bring about corrective measures but one message that I would like to tell the viewers would be regular exercise has clearly shown consistent regular exercise has shown sudden cardiac death to come down by 50% so that is the importance of regularly exercising 
and taking care of your lifestyle. Thank you. I would like to welcome Dr. Prakash to the stage, please. Welcome, Dr. Prakash. So, Dr. Prakash, we have seen that you have uh, the experience of working in US, uh, Germany, Taipei, so along uh, along the world, I can say. Uh, but in India, what have you seen which is different so that we are so much prone to cardiovascular disease? Yeah. See, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are the same everywhere. Dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, it's the same thing. It doesn't change. But yes, as you were pointing out, we have disease occurring in the young. So we have an accelerated disease process. That is what we notice in the Indians. The disease process rapidly progresses, one thing, and catches the young. The age of onset of the disease is very early. That's another important thing different from the rest of the world. There, they probably start seeing the disease at about 50 or 60 years. Here, we starting start to see at 32, 35 years, maybe even younger. And not only that, the case fatality rate in Indians is much higher. Because probably preventive measures are not in, and their lifestyle, and it catches the young. So, uh, the, you know, many of them have plaque rupture and acute MI, so the collaterals have not developed and the whole, uh, you know, the heart is still not ready for this kind of a impact. So the, the case fatality also is much higher. So rapid disease progression and age of onset plus the case fatality is what really makes the Indians stand apart from the rest of the world and that's the reason why we are at a higher risk. Lack of exercise is, is a big uh, uh, cause. Sedentary of lifestyle is global. They say laziness is, you know, it's a standard norm in the world today. It, it's more of a rule rather than an exception. You could, you know, it's there all over the world. However, yes, in India, the problem is we do, f and there's also something which is probably occurring at the young itself, the maternal health and then what really happens at that point, they find that there's early onset of obesity also in the children. So this also is, could have an impact on early disease onset in the Indians, which could uh, make a uh, difference compared to the rest of the world. And definitely our lifestyle today has changed quite a bit. All of us are sedentary and uh, that would make an impact and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome also is considerable uh, in the Indians, what you call as central obesity. See, you see most of the uh, Westerners are, are generally obese, generalized obesity. Here you see most of us have central obesity. You see everybody having a pot belly, isn't it? That's a very common thing. Central obesity is the biggest issue which you see in the Asians and primarily in the Indian subcontinent. That's the YY paradox, as we know. Exactly. Uh, the best thing was that we saw the crunches and the pull-ups you were doing. So the, I think the audience should be encouraged and they should also follow your lifestyle. That's the best part in the video. So thank you, Dr. Thank Prakash. You. We'll thank definitely you. come back to you again during the panel and we'll, we'll take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So next... Uh, We'd like to introduce someone who is an eminent personality, an eminent cardiologist of Bangalore. Professor, he's the professor and head of department of cardiology at St. John's Medical College and Hospital. His name is Dr. Kiran Varghese. So first, we'd like to see a video on him, his message, what he does regularly, and then we'll, we'll definitely go and meet him. Let's see the video. What started as a dream of becoming an engineer for a young boy changed into a reality of being an eminent and outstanding gold medalist doctor today. He's a renowned cardiologist known for his ethics when it comes to treatments of his patients. Meet Dr. Kiran Varghese, whose mantra in life is to be happy and healthy. He personally feels that if you want to be fit, then eat less and exercise daily. 
he practices what he preaches and on weekends he do cycling for approximately 50 to 60 kilometers apart from his daily routine of walking cycling and a special initiative to be near nature by working on his rooftop garden the highlight of his routine is that he prefers to walk wherever he goes during the day to be fit dr kiran believes in spreading happiness in people around him and society at large is relentless and untiring service to humanity by serving poor needy and old patients is acknowledged globally he had organized free angioplasty camp during january and february 2019 for economically underprivileged patients he even did free cardiac intervention along with free five stent for a poor homeless person living in his vicinity recently dr kiran set another remarkable feat by doing an angioplasty on the oldest man mr muniappa the news of which was published in all major newspapers including times of india dr kiran is working as professor and head of cardiology at st john's medical college hospital since 2013 he did his mbbs from st john's medical college bangalore in 1982 followed by md in general medicine from bangalore medical college and research institute in 1987 he further went on to do his dm in cardiology from shri jayadeva institute bangalore where his dedication and hard work made him excel in all his exams and he secured first rank during his dm exams in 1992 in his endeavor of upgrading his skills dr kiran did specialized trainings in the field of cardiology from globally renowned institutes such as fellowship in interventional cardiology from cedar sinai medical center los angeles usa he is also fellow of many reputed national and international associations to name a few are he is fellow of the american college of cardiology facc fellow of the indian college of cardiology FICC fellow of the cardiological society of india FCSI he is also life member of association of physicians of india dr kiran vargis in his medical career has a distinction of working with some of the leading hospitals of india and world post his dm he started as senior registrar cardiology at malia hospital bangalore from 1992 to 1994 followed by working as consultant cardiologist in chest diseases hospital kuwait from 1994 to 2000 then he joined as interventional fellow at the cedar sinai medical center los angeles from 2000 to 2001 and since 2002 he is associated with st john's medical college bangalore dr kiran's area of expertise includes interventional cardiology peripheral interventions and preventive cardiology dr kiran has deep interest in research and has worked as primary or sub investigator in numerous national and international trials he has over 30 full paper publications and over 60 abstracts published in reputed journals across the world to name a few are use of coronary hardware in peripheral vascular interventions necessity fostered in genuity is it solution enough in indian journal of heart 2018 dr kiran has also written a chapter in a book and authored a book titled Therapeutic Embolization apart from being a busy cardiologist and a rhythm specialist Dr Kiran loves to find time for his love for music singing and playing guitar and the only explanation i can find is the love that i found ever since you've been around your most let's listen to a healthy heart message from Dr Kiran Vargis a good morning sir very good morning to you any message for the patients because heart disease is the number one killer in the world although there is rising awareness but still the rate of death is very high with heart diseases you know and it is very sudden also right so uh, india is uh, probably among the highest rates of heart disease in the world it may not be a much of a surprise if i tell you that <clears throat> Uh, the maximum number of obese patients are in america but india is at number 3 in that position yes and i think that is partly contributing to our increased heart disease and uh, it's because we eat the wrong type of food we eat too much of that food and we exercise too little so whenever i tell my patients you need to lose weight they'll say yes doctor i'll start work, walking from tomorrow but the key to losing weight is to eat less the amount of calories in food is something which we don't realize 
and the calories we burn while say walking is very small you burn roughly 4 calories in a minute one milkshake is 400 calories one masal dosa varies from 250 to 1000 calories so with one milkshake that means you need to walk 100 minutes so people walk for 30 minutes and come and have a milkshake that just doesn't make sense so anyone who wants to lose weight it's all about eating less and eating healthy also eating healthy is probably second okay. because once you lose weight your automatically your blood sugar your blood pressure and your cholesterol will improve so losing weight is of fundamental importance what people do is they stop eating rice and eat chapati the same calorie amount it doesn't help you need to reduce the amount of food that you eat if you eat one peanut you need to walk 2 minutes to burn the calories so unless you are a manual worker you just cannot burn the amount of calories that are required so if you are serious about losing weight you need to eat less but you need to balance that with exercise because otherwise the body goes into what is called the famine mode and reduces your metabolic rate and you don't lose weight because the amount of calories that you burn at a resting state also will come down so to keep your metabolism up you need to balance it with adequate exercise but exercise is not the key to losing weight welcome dr vagis i think uh, one of the message from the video was that the secret to a healthy heart is the playing your guitar i mean <laughs> <laughs> probably you can start a band one start a band one day <laughs> thank you there's no time for that they say medicine is a very demanding mistress <laughs> yes. yes so uh, today we have a very uh, pertinent question important question for you uh, frequently we have seen that when there is a heart attack in a in an individual that person mistakes it for either just a ga- gastric problem or a acid or something and then they take uh, all those medications like eno and home remedies and then they lose the important time uh, which they might be suffering from a heart attack so how do you differ how do the patients differentiate between whether they are having a heart attack or a gastric pain so this is not an easy question to answer even experienced cardiologists can sometimes find it difficult to decide whether it's a heart attack or not and uh, sometimes need ecg and many investigations to really make a final diagnosis but there are several points which can be of help uh, to a lay person to decide whether this is something which needs attention or not so uh, i'd like to say what are the characteristics which uh, make you suspicious that it could be a heart problem and what are the points which point against it so the heart is an internal organ and the body handles pain in internal organs a little differently from the surface of the heart for example if a mosquito stings you you know exactly where the pain is and where uh, you can localize the pain but for internal organs the brain refers the pain to the surface of the body and it's not very accurate it's generally over a larger area and could be very variable so as far as cardiac pain is concerned it can be anywhere from the lower jaw up to the umbilicus so it's a large area typically it's in the center of the chest or to the left side left arm that's what most people know but it can also be on the right side right shoulder right arm back as i said neck and up to the umbilicus then the character of the pain most people expect a very severe pain which it could be but sometimes it's just a burning sensation so understandably if you have a burning sensation in the in the upper part of the stomach everyone will assume it is gastritis or gastric problem in truth there are so many other conditions which can also mimic uh, cardiac not just gastritis so it can be a burning sensation it can be a heaviness very often it's just a weight on the chest or a constricting feeling in the chest um and uh, which may or may not radiate down one arm or the other the duration is also important any pain that lasts less than 30 seconds is not cardiac any pain that lasts more than 6 hours is unlikely to be a heart attack but very often because it's not the full blown attack you know it can be a stuttering attack it can last much longer than that 12 hours sometimes longer but if it's been happening repeatedly let the patient says that i've had this pain this kind of pain lasting 6 7 hours i've had it last week and last year and like 2 3 times a month 
obviously each of those couldn't be a heart attack right so if it's been multiple similar episodes in the past one would kind of ignore that now there are a few points which point away from being a heart attack like i said since the heart is an internal organ you cannot make the pain worse by say pressing on the area so if if there is pain now if a patient comes to me and say doc i got pain here and points with one or two fingers straight away in my mind i'm thinking that this patient doesn't have a heart problem uh, because as i said it's a referred pain it's generally over a large area they come with a hand on the chest or it's a more diffuse area if you press the uh, area of pain and it gets worse it's likely to be local if it gets worse with movement of the arm or the neck or the shoulder again it's it's more likely to be musculoskeletal so these are some points which can help you uh, decide whether you need to take it seriously or not any in short any kind of discomfort which needn't be pain heaviness burning from the jaw to this associated with sweating which is a very important associated symptom should be taken seriously similarly if it's associated with breathlessness or light headedness these are symptoms which should prompt uh, medical attention and if it is a heart attack then 50% of the deaths due to a heart attack occur in the first one hour so that's the golden hour we say so it's it's important to get to a hospital with good medical facilities as quickly as possible if you think it's going to be a heart attack a lot of the delay is because the patient thinks it is something else then doesn't want to wake up his wife doesn't want to bother the neighbor but then after an hour or two he eventually does it so if you think it is likely to be a heart attack then get to a hospital quickly the background of the individual also plays a huge role now if a young lady you say a 20 30 year old lady who doesn't have major risk factors has fairly typical symptoms it's very unlikely to be a heart attack because the chance of a young woman who doesn't have risk factors non diabetic having a heart attack actually is quite low because age is the strongest risk factor and conversely young age is the greatest protector also we don't see this in male smokers lot of our young male heart attack patients are smokers they come in their 20s and 30s with heart attack so if you have multiple risk factors even somewhat atypical symptoms probably warrant uh, attention and if you are young and without risk factors probably uh we in our we also don't go aggressively after such patients if we think that they don't have much risk factors of course we are only talking of statistical probability of a heart attack and only tests will tell us further the key is probably keeping all the risk factors under control as was mentioned by the earlier speaker and regular checks so if you are a diabetic and you 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 should probably go for a regular check up and your cardiologist will assess that and tell you what the probabilities of a heart problem is and if that is the case how to take preventive measures okay good uh, thank you very much uh, dr vagis thanks for your inputs we got a fairly clear idea now how to differentiate i think definitely the audience will take a note of that so we'll come back to you in the panel uh, to have a more insights on this thank you thank you much, so uh for the next panelist uh, we would like to introduce somebody who is one of the eminent cardiologists of bangalore uh, his international cardiologist chairman and chief of cardiology trinity hospital and heart foundation his name is dr b g murli dhara uh, first we would like to see a video on him his message and definitely we'll go and have a chat with him after that let's see the video Path breaking and a trendsetter doctor who was born on 15th August, a true Indian at heart, who after completing his fellowship in interventional cardiology from Melbourne University in the year 1996, returned to India in 1998 instead of settling abroad with a clear goal to do something good for people of his motherland by bringing best quality of care, especially in the field of cardiology, saving lives is mission of his life. Me, Dr. B. G. Murli Thar, founder chairman of Trinity Hospital and Heart Foundation, since the year 
recently, he has also started Manasa Trinity Heart Hospital, a super specialty heart center in North Bangalore, Yelahanka, where he is currently working as chief interventional cardiologist. In 2006, he set up first non-invasive CT and geogram facility in entire South India, thereby offering one-minute painless angiogram to his patients. And in last 13 years, has done over 50,000 angiograms. Set up PPP model cardiac center with Jayadeva Institute, Bangalore. His area of interest is coronary angioplasty. And in last 25 years, he has done over 25,000 angioplasty. He is trained in whole body intervention. To name a few are carotid stenting, renal stenting, peripheral stenting, and embolization procedures. He also holds deep interest in acute stroke intervention. Dr. Murlidhar has been conferred with prestigious awards for his commendable services in the field of medicine. Name them are Rajiv Gandhi National Award and Dr. B.C. Roy Award. He has also been honored by various social organizations like Lions Club, Rotary Club, GSCS, etc. in acknowledgement of his service to the community. Recently, he has been bestowed with Shivaji Award by Karnataka Maratha Mahasabha. Dr. B.G. Murlidhar secured third rank in university during his graduation from Gulbarga Medical College, followed by MD in Internal Medicine from Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute. He further went on to do his DM in Cardiology from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal in 1992. As a part of upgrading his medical skills, Dr. B.G. Murlidhar did fellowship in Interventional Cardiology from Melbourne University in the year 1996. In past, he has served as an assistant professor of cardiology at NIMS Hyderabad and also as a consultant cardiologist at St. Vincent's Hospital located in Melbourne. Apart from doing active cardiac interventions, Dr. B.G. Murlidhar is also at forefront of spreading awareness about heart disease in India as preventive cardiology holds key for healthy India. In his mission to serve humanity, he had set up Heart Foundation and had organized over 400 free health checkup camps, along with other patient welfare initiatives in Bangalore, including rural parts of Karnataka. He had also conducted numerous public education programs, including health awareness lectures on AIR, All India Radio, Doordarshan, Odia TV, ETV, and many other local cable networks. Dr. Murlita believes in sharing his knowledge and clinical experiences with fellow doctors because he believes shared learning holds key for a healthy India. Till date, he has conducted over 300 CME programs, delivered more than 250 guest lectures on various cardiology topics at various forums including medical colleges and IMA conferences. Let's listen to Healthy Heart Message from Dr. B. G. Murlidhar. Hi, I would like to say this to the public at large, not only for the heart patients. You have only one heart, please remember that, try to save that heart. Once you have any heart problem or you think that you are likely to have a heart problem, get a checkup done well in advance so that you don't have to rush to the hospital with an emergency. Heart attacks are one of the leading problems that we face in India and also in India, we get heart attacks at a much younger age compared to the Western world. So the most important thing is, first thing is to prevent a heart attack. Never have a heart attack, never suffer from a heart attack. This you can do by maintaining a healthy lifestyle, by eating right kind of food and doing the right kind of exercise and walking and other activities. The biggest problem in our country is sedentary lifestyle. We stop playing the moment we go out of the college and we have a unhealthy lifestyle that is the cause of major heart problems and once you get a heart attack we have a concept called golden hours within the first six hours if you reach the hospital a heart foundation hospital and take treatment you can survive most people with heart attack can survive if the treatment is taken within the first six hours every one minute delay kills one lakh heart muscle cells so the time matters and delay is death and money and time is muscle. So we need to treat the, treat the hospital as soon as we can and also take treatment without any further delay. Heart attacks happen because of the blockages in the heart arteries called coronary arteries. 
because of deposition of fat and what does the fat get accumulated there it's because of eating the wrong kind wrong food and not doing enough exercise and once this is done it takes about 15 20 years for these blocks to develop they don't happen overnight but by a procedure called interventional angi procedure called angioplasty we can remove these blocks in 20 minutes clearly a 100% block can be reduced to 0% within 20 minutes so a problem which you have acquired over 20 years can be cleared within 20 minutes provided you reach the hospital in time and that can save your life welcome dr mulider to deal the deal tech hi uh, so our question for today is that uh, in today's scenario i mean the public knows that uh, we they have to do exercise uh, and uh, doctors specifically stress on that whenever the they having a cardiac disease or hypertension or they turn up in the clinic for lipid problems whatever uh, you people always stress on that but very few people actually they start it and very few people actually continue with that so is there something the doctors can do which actually can make the patients follow because everything success of the entire thing depends on the compliance with the exercise one is we need to emphasize, emphasize to people about these things importantly particularly when they are in the intensive care unit they listen to the doctors very carefully when they are in the icu the moment they are out of the icu the moment they think they are safe they don't think they need to bother about the doctors they need to listen to it so what i do is i make it a point to discuss with them on the day one after the procedure once it's over in fact i talk to them soon after the angioplasty saying that somebody who is smoking or somebody who is diabetic he has not bothered to take care of hypertension i tell him that see you are here in the first place because of these problems you don't want to come back again to me make sure that you don't repeat these mistakes if you repeat these mistakes you are going to get a heart attack again whether you like it or not so the important message is the message should go loud and clear from the chief doctor from the consultant who talks to the patient most of the time what happens is all these therapeutic life changes are left to the junior most in the team or to the paramedical people and they don't give importance to the doc, to the paramedical people in our country which is an unfortunate thing so the important thing is as a lead consultant we should take primary interest and talk to them about prevention and in fact i tell many people unless you promise me that you are going to quit quit smoking i am not even going to do an angioplasty because if i do an angioplasty and the guy continues to smoke i am sure he is going to come back with the reblockages that spoils his lung and spoils my reputation so both are at risk so i make sure many a patients particularly not only the heart attack patients of course we have little time when they come with gangrene of the leg problems with the leg they refuse to smoke stop smoking i have taken them off my table and say i am not going to operate on you so it need to, we need to drive home the point and make sure that they understand the importance of the thing also i tell them it is not just taking medicines that is going to help you it's equally important that you need to take care of your lifestyle changes and also need to understand why you got the heart attack in the first place it's not because of the medicines you got the heart attack in the first place because your diabetes was not under control your hypertension was not under control you were smoking and your lifestyle was lazy in fact nowadays we say sitting is the new smoking if somebody is sitting for more than 6 hours in a day that is equivalent to the risk of smoking of getting a heart attack so just sitting simple sitting can kill the patient so it's very important that we need to walk even people like computer professionals or software people who all the time sit they need to understand that they need to walk minimum 8000 to 10000 steps per day is what is recommended so if everybody walks 8 to 10000 steps most people can avoid a heart attack at least delay the heart attack so it's very important that we emphasize to them when they're in the critical case of illness and also straight from the horse's mouth so that it carries some value and also when they come to us every time make sure and discuss with them about the lifestyle changes whether they are doing it or not doing it or the reasons for not doing it and we need to emphasize upon them again and again i scare my patients also when they come back for a follow up and if they are not doing it be prepared to spend another 2 to 3 lakhs because you are going to get a heart attack sooner or later so when i put the fear of death in them and tell them that you know like this is going to be a huge financial risk for you and your family if you don't change your lifestyle most people do listen and most people follow yeah. but it's easier said than done so one of the things we have uh, one of the videos we are seeing in singapore there is a doctor uh, basically there is a patient group which he has they come to exercise and he joins them in the morning for 10 15 minutes in india i think most of the patients treat their doctors as gods next to gods 
So can we do something like that? Five <coughs> well, we are no longer treated next to gods, we are also treated next to demons. So let us not get into that. In fact, see, I, I live very close to Lalbag. I used to go for a walking 20 years ago, but today I can't afford to go because I get to see at least 200, 300 of my patients walking in the Lalbag. So I find a lot of people and then what happens is, not only they jog with us, they also do a free consultation on the path and then it goes over and on. So it does help, but it can, if it can, if it can motivate, if, see, anything that can motivate the patient, I think it's worth a trial. So if people are willing to do that and if you can join, I have no problem in joining, I have no problem in encouraging people to do that. But basically they need to understand that it's very important that the walking is, a, I mean, any kind of physical activity is important, at least the recommended is five hours per week, minimum of physical, cardiac activity, physical activity so that the metabolic parameters are taken care of. And if they are overweight, of course they need to do a little more. More than, and also apart from the physical activity, it is also the food that matters. The kind of food that they use and not eating enough fruits and vegetables is also one of the important risk factors for heart problem. So we need to emphasize on the food part also. It is, nutritional assessment is required. They need to get a proper assessment and advice on the food that they eat also, which is also equally important. The other problem is in our country is people think that, you know, like whatever the diet advice that is given, it's probably for a week or two, and once they're all right, they forget about it. So they need to understand that the diet changes that are advised, the lifestyle changes that are advised, it is for life, not for... I, another thing I keep telling my patients is, as long as you want to live, keep doing these things, three things. One is regular exercise, limited food, and then tablets. The day you choose to die, you take a call that I don't want to live anymore, then you can give it up. And also, remember that the day you give it up, your, start, your clock starts ticking. You can get into a heart problem, not only a heart problem, also a stroke, or a gangrene, or a vascular problem, anywhere. See, and, and also I tell them some frightening statistics. Tell them that 80% of the diabetic people are going to die of a heart attack. Half of the Indians are going to die of a heart attack. Put some scary figures in front of them so that they understand and they realize the importance of not getting into this problem again and again. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Mulizar, for your excellent inputs. Uh, definitely we'll discuss more about that in the panel discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome an eminent cardiologist and personality from Bangalore, he is the senior professor of cardiology, head of department of non-invasive cardiology at Sri Jayadev Institute of Cardiovascular Science and Research, which is a top-notch medical institute. Uh, so let us welcome Dr. T. R. Raghu. And first we'll see a video, uh, introduction on him, and then we'll hear a message from him. Uh, let's see the video. Meritorious scholar, Dr. Who hails from a family of agriculturists. He stood sixth in entire state of Karnataka during his PUC examination and is also a recipient of India National Merit Scholarship by Government of India during his PUC and MBBS exams. A skilled trainer, researcher and result-driven eco-cardiologist who had an extensive experience of nearly three decades in the field of interventional cardiology. He is an expert in invasive and non-invasive cardiology, interventional cardiology, non-coronary interventions, pediatric interventions and diagnostic cardiology, encompassing congenital heart disease. His mission in life is to bring best medical treatment for his patients and people of his native town. That is why once a month he renders his free medical services for people of his hometown. He believes that if all doctors at least give once a year free medical service to natives of their village or town, then India will have a better healthcare scenario. Meet Dr. T. R. Raghu, who is presently working as Senior Professor of Cardiology, Head of Department of Cardiology, since the year 2005, at Sri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Science and Research, a top-notch medical institution, considered as one of the world's leading cardiology hospitals. Dr. Raghu completed his MBBS in 1983 and MD in Internal Medicine from Bangalore Medical College in 1988 respectively. Further, he did his DM in Cardiology from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Dr. Raghu started his medical career in 1984 as Junior Resident at Ambedkar Medical College, Bangalore. 
followed by working as lecturer of medicine at Adi Chunchanagiri Institute of Medical Sciences, Mandya. And then he worked as senior resident cardiology at KMC Manipal, from where he did his DM in cardiology. After which he joined MS Ramaya Institute of Cardiology, Bangalore as assistant professor cardiology. Then in 1993, he joined Shri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Science and Research as lecturer of cardiology. Got promoted to assistant professor of cardiology in 2001 and then since 2005 serving as professor of cardiology. Now head of department cardiology since three years. Dr. Raghu's penchant for knowledge upgradation made him earn many internationally renowned certifications from globally renowned medical bodies. To name a few are Fellowship from Indian College of Cardiology in the year 1996, Fellowship of American College of Cardiology in the year 2011, Fellowship of European Society of Cardiology in the year 2014, Fellow of Society of Coronary Angiology and Interventions in the year 2015. Dr. Raghu has performed over 39,000 coronary angiograms, over 8,500 coronary interventions, including PTCA, stenting, rotablation, and direct stenting, over 3,800 balloon valvuloplasty procedures, such as PTMC, PADV, PTVP, and PBPV. He has also performed 100 procedures in congenital heart disease, such as pulmonary balloon valvuloplasty. Aortic Balloon Valvuloplasty, Coartation of Aorta, PDA and ASD Closure. In addition to this, he is a skilled trainer with a merit of training the students on cardiology. Acted as an evaluator for evaluation of thesis for awarding PhD degree from last three years for DM Cardiology students. Dr. Raghu is also working as MCI Inspector for assessing the quality of facilities and training for DM Cardiology in various medical colleges of India and as DM examiner for various medical universities in India for awarding DM degree. In the past, he had worked as member of Credentials Committee of Medical Council of India from 2012 to 2014. Since last three years, he is also serving as member of the Super Speciality Board of Sri Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. Dr. Raghu has over 25 paper publications in his name which were presented at various national and international conferences. Long-term results of multiple and multi-vessel PCI published in Cardiology Update book in year 2012-13. A patient with rheumatic heart disease presented with central cyanosis due to acquired methemoglobinemia during late pregnancy. A rare association published in Journal of Disease Research in year 2013. Dr. Raghu has served at key positions in several medical associations. Like, he was Honorary Secretary of Indian College of Cardiology, Vice President of Indian College of Cardiology, Honorary Treasurer at Indian College of Cardiology. Presently, he is President-elect for Indian College of Cardiology for the year 2019-20. He is also a life member of many medical bodies. To name a few are, Life Member of Cardiological Society of India. Indian Academy of Ecocardiography, Indian Medical Association, Indo-French Interventional Forum, Indian College of Interventional Cardiology, worked as a founder member, Indian College of Cardiology. Dr. Raghu is also actively involved in conducting free monthly cardiac checkup camps in different parts of Karnataka under the auspices of Rotary Club of Channa Patna since 1996. Let's listen to Healthy Heart Message from Dr. T. R. Raghu. I am Dr. T. R. Agu, working as Professor and Head of the Department of Cardiology, Sri Jaidava Institute of Cardiovascular Science and Research. And is, ours is one of the biggest cardiac centers in India. We see about 7,200 to 2,000 patients in a day. And I have got almost 25 years experience in Jaidava. As per my experience, commonest risk factor for heart disease, especially heart attack in India is uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking and hyperlipidemia and stress. Part, these are the five important risk factors and of late pollution has become an important risk factor. People who don't have risk factors because of pollution, all these microparticles goes to the lungs and goes to the blood vessels and cause there is increasing incidence of cardiovascular disease. Welcome Dr. Raghu to Dilse Diltak. Uh, sir, we have a pertinent question for you, uh, especially in India there is a big problem that young, lot of young people are developing coronary artery disease. Uh, 
So, what are the factors which are responsible for this? Does genetics uh, have a role to play in this, or is it just the lifestyle? Uh, which are responsible for development of CAD in the young? Does genetics uh, have a role to play in this? See, definitely, because whatever the common risk factors, modifiable risk factors play a role, and there are non modifiable risk factors like age, male sex, and uh, uh, hereditary, and these are all, and familial hyperlipidemia. And to study this premature coronary artery disease, in fact, Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Science started a research on premature coronary artery disease from 2018. My, my colleague, Dr. Rahul, is doing a study, and we have included now up to date 2,500. It's a prospect to study. It is going to cover genetic markers, going to non modifiable risk factors, and we are doing this study in association with. Uh, St. John's Medical College, Indian University of Science, and we are studying the genetic markers in addition to the non-modified risk factors. Whatever the present observation in these 2,500 patients, we saw modified risk factors like diabetes is only 10% of the patient, hypertension is 11% of the patient, and hyperlipidemia is only 13. And 50% of the patients are smokers in this premature coronary artery disease who are less than 40 years. Another 16% are hereditary family stiff coronary artery disease. And 25% of the patients, there were no risk factors. Yeah. And that the, mo most of these patients, what we have done, most of them are manual workers, the drivers, auto drivers, work in industries. And what our postulation probably, the pollution, air pollution is one of the important risk factors. Because these microns, 0.1 uh, micrometers or uh, 2.5 particle matters, they go into the lungs and probably inf inflammation occurs there. Some minor particles can enter the circulation. It can precipitate atherosclerosis and cause inflammation and cause atherosclerosis plaques and myocardial infarction. And we have studied actually, WHO has shown that 7 million people are having premature cardiac, cardiovascular death due to pollution. 7 million people in the world. In fact, in India, 1.6 million people are dying because of pollution. In China, 1.3 million people. Pollution. In fact, Robert Koch is the cholera vaccine founder. He told in 1910 only, we have to fight fiercely pollution as one of the risk factors for cardiovascular events, like we fought for cholera and other pest control diseases. It is going to be true because people who are genetically predisposed, there may be susceptible genes, then environment factors may play. Uh, for precipitating atherosclerosis heart disease. And there it is proved actually in various studies, there is increase in pollution, maybe by 5 microns to 10 microns per cubic meter, increase the incidence of cardiovascular events by 5 to 7 percent. The increase in incidence of hypertension, acute cardiovascular events, stroke, arrhythmias and heart failure. So, the hereditary or the genetics part also has... Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the environment acts on the genetic yeah. factors, both are so both are related to each other. Mm. So India at, at this moment we have, have a problem with both the environment, the diet and also the... I think the top send, uh, 10 cities in the world are highly polluted in Indian. Indian cities are there I think, out of 20 cities. Okay, I think the smaller cities will be, uh, they will have less heart attack because of uh, the less pollution over there. Another lot of studies are there on genetics, twins, monogenetic twins and families with coronary arteries. They are, de uh, they are more prone for five to seven times more prone for cardiovascular events. And another important factor is maternal. When maternal uh, exposure to pollution, pollution, toxins, drugs, when the child are more prone for premature coronary artery disease, they are more prone for diabetes. That is also going to be a big problem. Malnutrition in uh, the, yeah, yeah, in the, in the pregnancy, are, gestational, are they are here? more prone for premature coronary artery disease, more prone for diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Raghu. I think we have some uh, very important inputs uh, from you. Definitely, we'll take it up more in the panel discussion. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce to you, who is a eminent cardiologist of Bangalore. He's a senior consultant cardiologist in NH Narayan Institute of Cardiac Sciences. Uh, he is Dr. G.G. Shetty. We'll see an introduction video and also a message from him. Then we'll have a discussion with him regarding uh, one of the issues. So let's see, see the video on him. Arise, awake and do not stop until the goal is reached is quoted aptly by Swami Vivekananda. 
for people who want to create difference in lives of people around them presenting to you a journey of a doctor who has traveled globally for conferences because he firmly believes that learning is a continuous process till you reach your goal he is an avid thinker researcher clinician and above all an excellent organizer which makes him stand out from the crowd he is practicing cardiology since 1990 and had been trained in cardiology from some of the prestigious institutes of india like nizam's institute of medical sciences hyderabad banaras hindu university varanasi and gb panth hospital new delhi meet dr g g shakti who has performed over 6000 cath lab procedures till date and holds the specialization in performing coronary and peripheral angioplasty balloon valvuloplasty and pacemaker implantation currently His area of focus is doing cath lab procedures through radial approach and via radial route he has done more than 500 cath lab procedures till now Dr G G Shetty is a seasoned cardiologist and is currently working as senior consultant cardiologist at Narayana Hridayalaya Institute of Cardiac Sciences Osur Road Bangalore Dr Shetty pursued his MBBS from Karnataka Medical College at Hubli in 1985 an md in general medicine from mr medical college gulbarga in 1988 in his pursuit of knowledge dr shetty completed 2 years and 7 months training as senior resident in the department of cardiology of nizam's institute of medical sciences for the degree of diploma of national board cardiology which was awarded by the national board of examination new delhi post which he did his dm in cardiology from Institute of Medical Sciences Varanasi in 1995 he also underwent a 3 months training course in cardiac cath lab and color doppler echocardiography at GB Panth Hospital New Delhi Dr Shetty was awarded with fellowship of Indian College of Cardiology in the year 2000 and fellowship of Cardiological Society of India in the year 2006 Dr Shetty is committed to continued medical education and contributes regularly by giving lectures and participated in seminars he has been the examiner for dm cardiology course since the year 2007 dr g g shetty is associated with many esteemed medical bodies of india he was also an executive committee member of various medical associations like csi bangalore chapter csi karnataka chapter indian college of cardiology dr g g shetty was secretary of csi bangalore chapter for the year 2005 and 6 and honorary joint secretary of CSI Karnataka chapter for the year 2006-7 he is life member of various governing medical bodies like life member of API Bangalore chapter since 1988 life member of API central body since 1989 life member of medical education research trust since 1990 life member of CSI central body since 1992 life member of indian college of cardiology since 1995 life member of csi karnataka chapter since 2002 life member of indian academy of echocardiography since 2004 dr shetty has worked with some reputed colleges in karnataka such as jss medical college jn medical college and st john's medical college hospital at various designations such as lecturer and assistant professor and associate professor and professor as a senior resident he spent some time with nizam's institute of medical sciences and ims bhu varanasi he was also associated with belhol apollo hospital dubai uae as specialist cardiologist dr g g shetty is highly active in the field of clinical research since 1998 and has worked as a principal investigator in numerous trials he has more than 30 publications in the national and international journals to his credit to name a few are management of patient with mechanical prosthetic heart wall published in indian college of cardiology and transcatheter closure of aorta pulmonary window using implantable device published in journal of catheter and cardiovascular intervention dr gg shetty is recipient of numerous awards and accolades In fact, during his tenure as secretary of the Bangalore branch of Cardiological Society of India during 2006 and 7, the branch received the Best Branch Award, which is testimony of his excellent organizational skills. Dr. G. G. Shetty, apart from being in the forefront of medical field, is also working closely with needy and poor people so that they get quality cardiac care. 
for which he has organized free heart checkup camps covering overall health ecg blood sugar and cholesterol etc at various locations across the country like sagar haveri bangalore and gubbi let's listen to healthy heart message from dr g g shetty All of us know that we need to exercise regularly, and probably most of us are willing to do that also. The problem is time crunch. How to make time for doing a regular exercise? I think we should take a clue from our marketing people. Multitasking is <laughs> needs to be done here also. Making exclusive time for only exercising becomes difficult. so we can combine entertainment and uh, exercise so we instead of sitting and uh, watching the tv in a couch i would uh, rather suggest that you have your exercise equipments in front of the tv and utilize this particular time for your entertainment watching the tv as well as for exercise so make it compulsory for yourself to do this whenever you are watching the tv you can do either a treadmill or a bicycle like this or do your free hand exercises uh and this can go a long way in uh, your regular exercising yourself welcome dr shetty thank well, you this is something new we saw today uh, that exercising and entertainment can to go together so when we try to watch the next world cup or a cricket match probably we can do some exercises in between prolonged exercise yes uh, so uh, we have a very important question for you is that see we have lo- lots of heart attacks which are happening yeah but is this something we can do as a treatment immediately to save the life of the patient yes the answer is yes the immediate treatment which we give for patients with uh, heart attacks dr murli there has already stressed upon the golden period with the first six hours we have two options the clot which is sitting inside the artery can be bursted with medicines which are called as clot lysing med- medications streptokinase urokinase tpa and now tenecteplase which is being produced in india now which is quite a encouraging thing to know that the cost can come down uh the use of these medications which are quite expensive which were imported before are now being produced in india so they can burst this cross and open up the arteries one this is with medication the second one is with primary ptca as soon as you get into the hospital you know that you have a heart attack instead of waiting to do anything else directly take them to the cath lab identify the block and open it up with balloons and stents here we get almost instantaneous opening of the uh, artery within about 20 minutes to 30 minutes which can be achieved the crux is nearing uh, 80% of the facilities in india do not have this facility for primary ptc only a few tertiary hospitals can provide this and giving round the clock coverage providing expert people who can do it safely is the issue so where you cannot give the treatment of primary ptca within a stipulated time you can't a person who comes with a heart attack in the night you can't ask him to wait till the morning so we have to do it immediately and you need to have people who can do it safely these are the two issues with primary ptca the second thing is a uh, tenecte place which is uh, easily available medication which i said is being now produced in india and i hope the cost of these medications will also come down in the near future can be used extensively to treat these patients so i have an important question attached to that uh, in india a lot of these facilities they are in the center of the city or in the big cities and uh, sometimes the patients are have transferred by ambulance from these peripheral cities and they come to the big hospitals and they do they have all the facilities over there so during the transit time which can be 2 hours 3 hours because you said the golden hour time 
So do we have enough facilities for thrombolysis over there? That's another option. See, the opening up of the artery is going to be delayed by more than 90 minutes. There's, there's no point trying to wait for the artery to be opened by this method. Instead, what we can do is thrombolyze them first, then transfer them to a place where further treatment can be done. Okay, this is, so we have another part of the question is that, uh, so to prevent a heart attack, uh, do we have enough medicines today? Like if somebody has high cholesterol, we say it's a risk factor, taking a statin, can it prevent a heart attack? Or say aspirin, people uh, take over-the-counter medications sometimes, uh, like aspirin is very common. Uh, so is it possible they can prevent? We have enough and more medications to prevent heart attacks, plenty of them. We have got aspirin, which can reduce the chances of uh, getting a heart attack by about 15 to 20 percent. Then we have statins, which given properly can reduce the chances of heart attack by about 25 percent. Combinedly, aspirin plus uh, statins, which are easily available even in the remote places, can be used to reduce the chances of getting a heart attack. See, Dr. Murlidhar also pointed out, it is not that uh, this disease comes up just like that suddenly. It's like uh, the first time you on the engine of your car, the smoke starts depositing in your silencer. Similarly, the coronary arteries, the deposition is a slow process. It starts very young. By the age of about 20, it starts up. So what is important if you are very serious about the prevention aspect of it, catch them young. Get your first lipid profile done at a very early age, about 20, and make them aware, say, look, you have a problem here, better correct it. Otherwise, you're going to have consequences later in life. And they are receptive at that particular age. They have the ability to excise also. So advise them, and also we need to set an example by doing it ourselves before we tell to this young generation. Otherwise, they can be quite inc or, or not easy to convince them to do what they are supposed to do. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Actually, I was supposed to ask you only one question. I've asked you three questions. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll take more questions during the panel discussion we'll be have uh, after a while. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetty. Thank you. Thanks nice for talking to you. So we have come to the end of the first part of the program. Uh, so we'll come to the next part, which is the panel discussion in a while. Give us a few minutes back. We'll, we'll be back. So stay tuned in the meantime. When it's about keeping your heart healthy, don't be careless. Know what's right to keep your heart healthy. From India's renowned heart specialists, Dr. V.S. Prakash, Dr. B.G. Murlidhar, Dr. Kiran Varghese, Dr. T.R. Raghu and Dr. G.G. Shetty. Log on to Facebook page, Dil Se Dil Tak Healthy Heart on 27 July, Saturday from 7 p.m. onwards. When it's about keeping your heart healthy, don't be careless. Know what is right to keep your heart healthy from India's renowned heart specialists, Dr. V.S. Prakash, Dr. B.G. Murlidhar, Dr. Kiran Varghese, Dr. T.R. Raghu, and Dr. G.G. Shetty. Log on to Facebook page, Dil Se Dil Tak Healthy Heart on 27 July Saturday at 7 p.m. onwards. 
ನಿಮ್ಮ ಹೃದಯವನ್ನ ಆರೋಗ್ಯಕರವಾಗಿಡೋ ವಿಷಯದಲ್ಲಿ ನಿರ್ಲಕ್ಷ್ಯ ಮಾಡದಿರಿ ಭಾರತದ ರಿನೌಂಡ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಎಸ್ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಬಿ ಜಿ ಮುರಳೀಧರ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕಿರಣ್ ವರ್ಗೀಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಟಿ ಆರ್ ರಘು ಹಾಗೂ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಜಿ ಜಿ ಶೆಟ್ಟಿ ಅವರಿಂದ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಹೃದಯವನ್ನ ಆರೋಗ್ಯಕರವಾಗಿಡುವ ಸರಿಯಾದ ರೀತಿಯನ್ನ ತಿಳಿದುಕೊಳ್ಳಲು ಜುಲೈ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತೇಳು ಶನಿವಾರ ಸಂಜೆ ಏಳಕ್ಕೆ ದಿಲ್ ಸೆ ದಿಲ್ ತಕ್ ಹೆಲ್ದಿ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ ಫೇಸ್ಬುಕ್ ಪೇಜ್ ಗೆ ಲಾಗ್ ಆನ್ ಆಗಿ welcome back dil se dil tak now we'll have an interesting phase uh, which is the panel expert with all the five experts today the first question is for dr prakash uh, uh, is a very important question i keep asking this question to everybody uh, whenever i meet a eminent cardiologist because this is a very important part of the entire management of cardiovascular disease is that can we actually diagnose an impending heart attack before actually it happens like a preemption by doing tests because nowadays we have a lot of uh, um, very uh, good advanced uh, uh, radiological tests which are available so ct angiography ct calcium scoring stress test does this shed any light that this person is going to have a heart attack in the next 6 months to 1 year yeah that's a very pertinent question you see the most important thing is there there an array of tests available today but uh, the clinician needs to decide which one he would want to use to make a diagnosis or rather preempt to make a diagnosis that is likely to have a heart issue in the future so we have the pretest probabilities we'll have to look at low risk intermediate risk and high risk so once you've clinically categorized what category the patient comes into then accordingly you need to select your tests each test has its own limitations its advantages and disadvantages uh, barring a coronary angiography which is gold standard but that also has its limitations let's start with the least invasive the most friendly test that you can do a stress ecg a stress ecg is a very simple test you make the patient walk and then you stress the heart and the ecg starts showing changes this again depends on the pretest probability if the pretest probability is low to intermediate there could be a lot of false negatives as also false positives but it has its limitations and advantages pretest possibility being high it tends to the the positive predictive value or the uh, sensitivity specificity starts rising so that's the advantage or disadvantage of a stress ecg let's look at calcium score calcium score again has you have to again categorize pre uh, test whether high or if the patient is a low to intermediate uh, probability for coronary artery disease his risk is lo- low you have a calcium score which is zero it has a solid negative predictive value okay. once your calcium score is zero and you have a low to intermediate you can more or less rule out coronary artery disease in that patient but if he is a high risk then if the calcium score is zero you still can't exclude coronary artery disease in him and in young in the young you may not see calcium you may have a plaque which could, which would be ready a soft plaque which can just rupture and land up with a heart attack so again predictive value in that subset of patient the young it has its limitation let's more that is when you probably move on to the next little invasive uh, test which is a ct coronary ct coronary again the same thing intermediate low versus high risk again intermediate to low if the ct coronary is normal ct coronary again the negative predictive value is very high in that subset of patients the ct coronary is normal you can just send him from the emergency room back home saying that you are very unlikely to have a cardiac problem or a heart attack in the future there's high probability yes ct coronary has its advantages it definitely brings in the diagnosis the 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 sensitivity is very high specificity it has its limitations and again if the calcium score is very high ct coronary cannot read through the calcium if a patient is undergone a stent ct coronary again cannot read through the cal- i mean the, the stents so these are the limitations with even these tests but that's what i would probably say low intermediate and high based on that you can categorize these tests and likewise choose which would be the one that would give you enough information about the future of your patient so uh, in the future as we see uh, we are going towards a very 
strong economy, developed economy. So money is not a problem. In the future, it will be lesser of a problem. More will be the propensity of developing more heart disease. Can this test become a part of a community outreach in the future? Yes. Somebody coming into the ER and then you do your CT coronary, I think that gives you reasonable information about ruling out coronary artery disease. Somebody comes with chest pain and you want to be sure. You do a troponin. Troponin is negative. You do a repeated troponin three hours. It's negative. You're more or less kind of sure that he doesn't have an acute coronary. But you want to be sure that he has coronary artery disease and how to medicate him. CT coronary probably would guide you. And we also have something known as an FFR CT coronary, which would add information, which would add much more information. See, this is all anatomical. That is giving you physiological information. So that kind of adds information to this. And definitely, I think today CT coronary has reached that level where the positive predictive value could be very high. But in the, you have to start with looking at your patient, low, intermediate, or high. So that is how, likewise, the accuracy of these tests start climbing. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Uh, next question we have for Dr. Mulidhara. Uh, there's a myth uh, that the patient who does angiography will have to undergo angioplasty in the, uh, in the future. So is it so, or I mean, one precedes the other, or one leads to other? An angiogram and then he gets an angioplasty done, he gets a stent put in. This is not true at all. If you look at the statistics anywhere in the world, even including India, in any hospital, if you do 10 angiograms, probably 1, 2 or 3 only will end up with a stenting and angioplasty. 70, 7 out of 10 do not get an angioplasty done. So it's probably about 3 out of 10 or 2 out of 10. So it does not mean that everybody who goes for an angiogram gets an angioplasty. The only situation where they go for an angiogram and angioplasty in the same setting is what Dr. G.G. Shetty earlier said. When we are doing a primary angioplasty, if somebody comes with a heart attack and he has a blockage, we do an angiogram and we find a blockage, we almost always recommend angioplasty in the same city. That is called primary angioplasty. But for that, in the other setting, they always have the option to come back and take a call. It doesn't have to be necessarily done. So that's a very common myth. Unless the patient has a heart attack, Angioplasty and angiogram do not have to be done in the same city. And also these are two different things. Angiography and angioplasty are two different things. People also have confusion about that. People need to understand that angiography is a test performed to identify whether you have a blockage or not, whether you have suffered from a heart attack or not. Whether the angioplasty is a treatment procedure done to clear these blockages. And in the angioplasty procedure, most often these days, almost invariably, we end up using a stent. Again, there is a confusion. People think angioplasty is different and stenting is different. No. Angioplasty and stenting are two, two parts of the same procedure. It is like first innings and second innings. We do an, first we do say, if we identify a blockage, we use a balloon to dilate it. That is called angioplasty. That is followed by stent implantation. That means a piece of metal tube goes along with the balloon and that gets implanted in the heart. So angioplasty and stenting are part of the same procedure. Whereas angiography is only a test. And not necessarily every patient who gets an angiogram gets an angioplasty. That is a real myth. But leaving aside the primary angioplasties, if there is a situation like a patient having dyslipidemia, having occasional chest pains, uh, we do an angiogram. And then uh, finding a block which needs an angioplasty in the future. Do we wait for the next to patient to come back or we do it then and there? See, as Dr. Prakash put it, if the patient has got no symptoms, he mm. only has risk factors, absolutely no symptoms. There we are doing an angiogram only for risk profiling. In that case, probably a CT angiogram would suffice. We don't have to do necessarily a conventional angiogram. Mm. A conventional angiogram is done only when we think that his pre-test probability of having a block is very high, his chances of requiring a stent are also pretty high. If you think he's a lower and intermediate risk and he has only risk factors, probably I would recommend only a CT angiogram, not a conventional angiogram at all. If we do a conventional angiogram with a physiological evidence saying that he has a stress test which is positive, he has got a stress echo which is positive, and then I do an angiogram and I find a significant block, critical block in the proximal coronary arteries, probably we are justified in doing angioplasty in that city. Thanks. Uh... Uh, so next question is for Dr. Vaghese, a very important question is that <clears throat> when a patient goes with a chest pain, having a heart attack or 
doesn't have a heart attack with a chest pain, repeated chest pain, diabetic patient. Sometimes the doctor decides to do angioplasty. Sometimes they do a CABG or a bypass. And the patient sometimes uh, comes up with a complaint that we could be, because angioplasty is so popular, said we could have done a balloon angioplasty. Why we need a CABG in that patient? So how do you differentiate which, to, which patients to choose for our angioplasty and which for a CABG or a bypass? Clearly, there are many different uh, parameters to be evaluated before one takes that decision. But like Dr. Murlidhar said, if a patient has come with chest pain and is actually having an active heart attack or what you call a STEMI, then there's, uh, there's no decision. I mean, just go ahead and open up the culprit artery. That means okay. whichever block, he may be having multiple blocks, but yes. whichever block is causing the heart attack, that should be opened up then and there. I don't think there's much debate about that, and that's mm -hmm. the universal practice. The, I think the, your question is more applicable to a person who is stable, who's just undergone an angiogram, yes. whether he has angina or not, whether he has most probably a abnormal stress test and that's why the angiogram has been done and this has shown some blocks. And uh, judging from your question, uh, I think uh, the question is why wasn't angioplasty done rather than yes. why was surgery yes. done? Yes. So there are certain blocks for which angioplasty gives superior results and there are some which for which bypass surgery. Traditionally patients who had a block in the left main coronary artery, that means the left sided artery starts as a single stem and then, and then uh, branches into two. So that is called the left main and it, often the disease involves the bifurcation. That and uh, chronic total occlusions, that means totally blockage vessels which have been blocked for more than three months. Such vessels are traditionally difficult to do with angioplasty. However, a lot of technology has advanced nowadays and nowadays we are commonly doing left main angioplasties and even chronic total occlusions. Yet, there are certain instances where we feel that surgery gives better results. Clearly, those with multiple blocks and diabetes. Long-term results seem to be better with bypass surgery. So even though the patient obviously would favor a quick angioplasty, we need to convince them that surgery is a better option in view of long-term results. Again, there are patients who have a lot of diffuse disease, heavily calcified. Many of these are not amenable for angioplasty. We can do rotablation. We, we do it once in a while to remove the calcium. But sometimes the disease is just too extensive. It's not worth it. You need multiple stents, very complex procedure, whereas surgery can relatively easily be done if the distal vessel is good. Similarly, Indians commonly have small, diffuse, small vessels with diffuse disease. The smallest stent which is commonly used is 2.5 millimeters in diameter. And many of the patients have blocks in vessels which are 1.5, 2 millimeters in diameter, which is too small to put in a stent, and yet a good surgeon can easily graft them. So there are definite instances where we find that uh, a good surgical procedure, CABG, gives better long-term results. However, even in such instances, if the patient is very frail or has bad lungs or a very weak heart, then they may not be able to withstand the surgery. So even though the first choice would be bypass surgery, we do offer angioplasty and we do that once in a while. We may not do every single block but at least to improve matters. So uh, the decision really has to take into account many factors, and I think uh, the cardiologist is best suited for that. And my message to the public is leave the decision to the cardiologist. He definitely wants to do angioplasty, and yet if he says bypass surgery, accept that and please go ahead. So this is a very important message. We should leave the Google doctor and listen to the actual doctor. So this the public should drive on the message to from today. So next question is for uh, Dr. Raghu. Uh, this question is very important because people are having more of heart attacks in their working, within their working life, 45, 40, 50. And uh, there is a reason for it returning to work. So sometimes... Uh, uh, they are in important positions, they are holding uh, important posts. So what is the time, uh, minimum time, 
which they re for rehabilitation after a heart attack, after a stent or say bypass, how sooner can they return and what are the factors which depend on that? See, cardiac rehabilitation is an in integral part of management of heart patients because that is all, probably in India cardiac rehabilitation is not developed, but Europe and Euro US is part of Medicare because after an acute myocardial infarction, after angioplasty, after bypass surgery, Medicare pays for the rehabilitation of those patients. It may take for uh, 30 days or 2 months, Medicare pays, but in India that is not developed. That is more important because after an heart attack, a lot of patients become psychologically depressive, sometimes anxiety. We have to deal with psychosocial aspects before going to that. Probably a lot of patients after angioplasty, they think they have gone to a major problem, they may not uh, survive and bypass. All these patients, have first aspect you have to deal with psychosocial, then rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is important component because it depends on the severity of the heart problem. If patient has got a minor problem, he has got a stem, one single vessel block, heart function is normal, he has stented, or he had a mild heart attack, heart function is preserved, probably two to three weeks rest he can go back to his normal. Usually he, he, once he goes to a second visit, probably cardiologist will assess his cardiac status, he will do a stress test, you do an echocardiogram, there is no abnormality, he can do his normal excess capacity, then always they can, they can go back to their work. Only problem when they have got a massive myocardial infarction, heart is damaged, heart function is weak, probably it takes long time to recover it. If they undergo bypass or angioplasty, still they have to take at least four to six weeks of rest. Then again reassess by the primary physician or a cardiologist, they have to do an echo, they have to do a, probably if they have got ectopic, they have to do volta, they have to do a limited excess state. Depend up, depending upon the excess capacity, we can advise them to start doing their activities, probably increase their activity over a period of time. Probably it may take three months, four months, especially bypass surgery because wound healing itself will take some time. So most of these patients, they can go back to their normal work, normal work after surgery or angioplasty or uh, after my management of acute myocardial infarction. Another important aspect is sexual counseling is also important. Most of these patients are afraid of after weeks or months of an heart attack, after an angioplasty or surgery, they are afraid of having sex. And that's also then their partner will come and tell this is the problem. They are also afraid. And these things should be discussed with the patient, with the family as a part of the cardiac rehabilitation and tell them these are the things. Probably if they can able to do moderate activity, they can have their normal sexual life. Another important aspect, when you are doing rehabilitation, you are also dealing with the lifestyle management. You are going to reduce the risk factors. You are going to have, they have always, uh, healthy diet is also part of the rehabilitation are going to reduce the risk and it is going to reduce the mortality, morbidity, increase the longevity of the patient with heart attack and angioplasty and bypass surgery. And does the type of work also dictate when they can, because uh, some people are manual laborers, maybe, I mean, uh, cricketers or footballers, let's come to the sports part, if the young people, people they also have heart attack. So, is it, I mean, can they also return to the active It is force? depends on the severity of the heart attack. Yeah. If it is a mild heart attack, they can go back to their work. Because a lot of, we do a lot of uh, KSRTC drivers, a lot of uh, uh, auto drivers, they go back, do, go back to their work. Only thing I, because I say security, probably pilots, if they have got a heart attack, if they are uh, mild, mild heart attack, he'll be, uh, he cannot uh, pilot uh, this one. There are some eye sensitive, uh, this one, when you risk to the uh, population is more than you, you, you have to add. If you got a minimal heart disease also, they will be. Thank you, Dr. Raghu. Next, we will uh, come to Dr. Shetty. Uh, recently, Donald Trump says that kidney is at the heart. So, with the, uh, recently, this comment has come up. So, we will start with that. Uh, so, there are problems like kidney disease, say hypertension or dyslipidemia. Uh, is heart attack more common in this type of patients, especially kidney disease? What do you think? The answer is, a simple answer is yes. Risk factors, you are basically asking yes. me about yes. the risk factors. Yes. Risk factors can basically classified into two types. One is modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Let me start with the non-modifiable risk factors. A family history. What can you do about it? You are born to your parents. So you can't change your genes now, you can't change your parents. So you have to live with what we have. A family history of heart attack. See, recently uh, the latest journal of uh, Indian Heart Journal has come out with an editorial emphasizing the importance of uh, a test called as LP little a. 
this is called as the deadly cholesterol, levels more than 50 are considered as a marker of a rapidly progressing atherosclerosis within the coronary artery disease, predisposing them to early heart attacks. So family history, you have already stressed upon blood pressure, then you have uh, sugar or diabetes, third is cholesterol, fourth very important one is smoking, fifth excess body weight with uh, we measure what is called as the waist hip ratio if we have got a bigger tummy or a waist hip ratio people have a bigger waist hip ratio are more prone for coronary artery disease inactivity 10,000 steps per day if you are not doing it there again you are exposed to the heart, heart problems and then we have got a few other uh, type A personality if you are a uh, high achiever and get the way you respond to a problem decides how much of uh, adrenaline you pump into your system which can enhance atherosclerosis. There are, there are many substances which can be pumped into the body which can be controlled by your behavior reducing the blood pressure and reducing the risk of atherosclerosis within your body. So type A personality is the other one. And certain other substances called as uh, hyperhomocysteinemia, these are the other ones. We have got a beautiful study which was done and uh, St. John's was uh, the center of this particular uh, study called as the Interheart study which came from India which has emphasized and clearly told there are nine important risk factors which predispose us to the development of heart disease yes. which I have just now enumerated. Yes, so uh, if you see nowadays I mean a lot of diagnostic tests are available and you say there will be little a. Uh, so apple protein is also there, there are other uh, markers as well. So along with the LDL, generally the doctors, they suggest doing an LDL level, lipid levels, sugar levels, uh, then creatinine levels. So can we add this to the tests as well? Does it help? Yes, it does help. We need to have a regular test. I was just emphasizing, we need to do this test early in life so that a person who is prone for it knows that he has this problem. Dyslipidemia hmm. is a problem which we need to do this test at the age of 20. LDL more than uh, more than 130 or more than 160, they need to treat them. And then uh, LP little a, which also can be done and say that, see, look, genetically you are a high person, you are at a higher risk of developing the coronary artery disease. So yes, these tests need to be done early. And then do a H, instead of just doing a simple blood sugar, do a HbA1c. I have many instances where sugars have been done, found to be normal and you do a HbA1c, it is more than uh, 6, 7, 8 and, and some of the people who come with heart attacks, I have seen them, they say I am not a diabetic and uh, their H, the HbA1c will be somewhere not 9, 10, 11. Okay. So they miss out this particular. So it is important to have a regular checkup from a very early age. If you want the long term results, start it early. So how important is the kidney? If somebody has a, I mean, stage 3 or something like that, is he more prone to a heart attack? Yes. People with chronic kidney disease are at a higher risk of developing uh, the atherosclerosis, not just in the coronary arteries, but in the entire body, Me in the brain, in the kidneys, in the peripheries. So they are more prone for developing. And most people with kidney disease, they die of heart attacks. So we need to involve a nephrologist quite early in the management? Mm, I wouldn't say unless there is uh, an elevated uh, serum creatinine or a drop in GFR, that's the stage when at which I would uh, ask the nephrologist to intervene. So Before that I can do it myself. So again, I mean, uh, during the first phase also I asked you three questions, now I will ask you the third question. So what about the gender bias? Uh, Females, they generally, we have heard that females do not develop heart attack. They give heart attacks, but they themselves are secure. So, what is your view on this? Yeah, they give heart attacks when they are young. <laughs> yeah, they give heart attacks when they are young. Let me tell you this. Up to the age of about 45, when they are during the fertile period of life, God has also been partial to them. They do not develop these heart attacks. Later in life, once they develop menopause, in about 10 years, 
the risk of coronary artery disease in men and women is almost the same. So up to 45, they are protected. Next 10 years, they catch up with the disease and by about 55, the risk of heart attack both in men and women is almost the same. And then starts after 55, say for example, a woman develops a heart attack. They fare badly. They got smaller vessels, smaller size vessels. And while recovering from the heart attack, the mortality it, as a result of heart attack in women is higher. So initially they are protected. Later on, they catch up. Later in life, they pay for it in a bigger way compared to men. I hope I have answered your question. So yes, life is a great leveler. That's what we learned. So, so we should be careful about it. Uh, there is one question from my end, I mean, which is not there uh, in the list. But I would like to ask uh, all of you this question is that we are seeing new drugs in the treatment of uh, one of the complications of uh, heart attack or heart disease is heart failure, commonest. And this is a big, big menace for us. And we can see anti-diabetic drugs being tried in that, like SGAT2. What's your view, individual view on that? I'll start with Dr. Prakash. Uh, if you're specifically talking about SGLT2, yes, I think that's come in a big way. Next to metformin, I think metformin is the number one uh, diabetic drug today, which is listed as an anti-aging drug. That's the, that's the uh, unique thing about metformin. I think next to that, probably SGLT2 inhibitors have overtaken all the others, and they are next in the line. Insulin is way down. So SGLT2 inhibitors, all of them as a group, uh, they have tried uh, various trials uh, uh, with, uh, you know, each one of them, dapagliflozin and uh, even the others, have clearly shown their superiority in, in the terms of reducing heart failure and very safe in, uh, you know, in reducing kidney issues in patients with diabetes and uh, reducing cardiovascular risk and morbidity and all that. So I think... Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have really come a long way and they are now listed as the number two in the list. Sulfonuria is a way down and uh, insulin probably somewhere in the vicinity but definitely not uh, in comparison. The higher risk of, especially the analogs they have said, higher risk of uh, cancer and those issues which are there with insulin, increased obesity, weight gain, those problems which are not seen with SGLT2 inhibitors. So that is what uh, probably my have comment you, on SGLT2 would be. Have you used it in heart failure? Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I normally, I definitely start with metformin. I, normally we have the endocrinologist take care of our diabetic patients, but whenever we are uh, into prescribing diabetic drugs, the second line uh, next to metformin is an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I find them very friendly. Very few patients have problems with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and their toler tolerances are pretty good. L chances of hypoglycemia, all those are still much on the lower uh, range in comparison with uh, sulfonylureas. They're very friendly drugs. Your view on it? Well, I'm with SGLT2 inhibitors. In fact, according to me, the best thing that has happened to the heart failure patients in the last 10 years, apart from ARNI inhibitors is SGLT2 inhibitors. They are useful in patients with congestive heart failure, both with reduced heart function and with preserved ejection fraction. It's beautiful drugs. It will reduce the plasma volume without affecting the kidney flow, without affecting the renal parameters. Most of the cardiac patients we get, almost more than half of them have got diabetes. So I, I would entirely agree with Dr. Prakash. Today, according to me, at least as per the cardiologists are concerned, Next to metformin, the drug that we use is SGLT2 inhibitors. We, in fact, as I put, as he said it, put it, it's way ahead of even insulin. Insulin has got a lot of problems, very difficult to use in our country, and insulin is contraindicated in patients with heart failure. It does bad. They gain weight, the heart failure worsens. And most of our patients, when they come with myocardial infarction, uh, in India, they come with a delayed presentation. Invariably, a lot of them have got reduced ejection fraction. And in all of them, SGL inhibitors have done wonders. They do extremely well. Though they say there are some complications with SGL2 inhibitors, the most dreaded being the phoneus gangrene and then mycotic infections. At least 
See, I have been using SGLT2 inhibitors for the last four years. I have at least more than 1,000 patients on SGLT2 inhibitors. I have not seen it. Though my diabetologist colleagues claim that they have seen one, two, but when we are using in thousands of patients and we don't see a single mycotic complex in infection, I think it's pretty rare. So most of the problem is in our patients, SGLT2 inhibitors, they do very well and they are tolerated extremely well. There are no risks of hypoglycemia. And most of the drugs can be used even in patients with mild to moderate renal dysfunction. And we have fantastic results with empaglyphosin, CANA, and DAPO, all three of them. Particularly in patients with established coronary artery disease, particularly with heart failure. I think these are wonderful drugs. They have helped us a lot in preventing heart failures and in preventing readmissions to the hospital, which is the biggest problem of the heart failure. You My take is different because all this Empareg, Canvas, uh, declared to me, they never studied heart failure patients. So only cardiovascular disease, they reduce heart failure hospitalization. There is no data for treating hospital. Only now EMPA reduce, EMPA uh, preserve is studies going yes, on. Yes. The data is expected in 2020. At present, as per the guidelines, there is no indication for treating heart failure. Only you should be careful because ARNI itself causes diuresis, natriuresis and there is a fluid de depletion. When you are giving diuretic, when you are giving ARNI, if you give SGLT inhibitors can cause problems and patient, you should be careful when you are giving. But as, as per the data, there is no treatment as indicated in heart failure. That is my take on that. You can use it as a, uh, um, as a control of diabetes, not for heart failure. Well, FDA has recently come out with a clear guidelines saying that in patients with diabetes, with established coronary artery disease, empaglyphosin is given as a cardioprotector. See, earlier the drugs were studied to see if they are causing any cardiovascular complications and increased mortality. But now, it has come with a clear guideline. FDA has clearly given a guideline saying that you should use empaglyphosin in patients with diabetes, with established heart disease to prevent cardiovascular complications and to protect the heart. So, there are three different trials. All of them are clearly shown. In patients with established coronary artery disease, in, in empaglyphosin, in uh, empaglyphosin trial and CANA, both Empareg and this one, 60% of the patients and 70% of the patients in these two trials had established coronary artery disease, had heart failure, had MI. So it was a clearly secondary prevention trials, both of them. They are not primary prevention trials. In both these trials, it has clearly shown mortality benefit. There is no doubt about it. Only with declared ME23, which is a primary yes. prevention trial, where only 10% of the patients had got established heart disease, 80% did not have established heart disease. There it is, it did not show mortality benefit. There it showed only heart failure benefit. As far as empire is concerned, heart failure is reduced, cardiovascular mortality is reduced, total mortality is also reduced, which is a very, very strong endpoint. In fact, this is a very strong endpoint. I'm sure my friend also agreed with that program. He clearly said it is impossible to prove mortality benefit through these days when the patient is already at 8 6 standard therapies. Well, this was used in addition to the standard care therapy, which is the standard as of now. When we add to the table, there is a mortality benefit, which is a very hard point, which is very difficult to prove. We have had any very few drugs in the last 10 years which have come with mortality benefit. So I don't think there is any doubt about using ever the person in patients with established heart failure. In fact, I would want to say that if you don't go into the person today to a diabetic patient with established coronary heart disease, Probably we are failing in the future. And last two. Yeah. Daniel, if you have a scenario like that, somebody after a primary angioplasty having some sort of heart failure, then you feel always any AC inhibitor plus your AC inhibitor. How will the results be? So, are you talking about a diabetic patient or a non diabetic patient? The issue is, is the patient diabetic or not? If the patient is diabetic, there is no question about it. The American Diabetes Association guidelines very clearly mentions that after metformin, the next drug should be empaglyphosin, like he said, not just SDITP, because as you only read, we just very strongly show the mortality benefit, not just coming back to the mortality, but all the other mortality. We are not talking about the hospitalization for heart failure, but also there is a robust reaction. So there is no, no question about it. And in order to look at the American Heart Association recent guidelines on primary prevention, even they have said that in diabetics, after that time in the second round of choice, they will say diabetic in heart disease. In 
point is that after the time of the second branch should probably be an RCFD to an indicator. And I firmly believe that the only problem is the cost. So in the legal context, not many of our patients can afford it. And sometimes we need to give a drug which they can afford rather than the best treatment because they will stop it. So some people is clearly better than no treatment. There's no doubt about it. SGLTP inhibitors are, are the great drugs for diabetics with uh, established cardiovascular disease and definitely so if there is a element of heart failure. Now whether it should be used in a patient with heart failure who is non-diabetic, I think we need to await data on that. We have other drugs in the garden which have also come out of the scene. We can use all that and await the results. Anyway, it should be off the I wouldn't say it is wrong because there is very uncommon data, but trials are all going for that. And we have got a very important uh, aspect of where actually endocrinology and cardiology might uh, actually merge. This is very important. I think the future program where we can take up a uh, separate uh, actually discussion on this.
basic question here right now. Many of our scientists would like to uh, see how much we can uh, uh, get uh, things, get, get, uh, things, get corrected, uh, all those things. We can maybe we can uh, we could educate. Maybe some of the doctors can uh, let me know it for a long distance and is all. Maybe we would like to give a talk. And I also would like to welcome all the doctors, uh, the Science Center at the Rocket Lab Complex, uh, which we recently launched at Chennai. Uh, and we are happy to take you as a VIP uh, delegate. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Dumbo. You should come down here to show them. Hey, I would welcome to all. I think as doctors it is our duty yes. and many of us would be happy to come and give a talk to ISRO or to any other organization because yes. most of you will have noticed are quite passionate about prevention and even free work. So, so free camps are being done by all of us. To come and give a talk in such a center would be our greatest pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just to note in specific the cardiovascular diseases. Most of the developments which we are using, maybe the stems, maybe the ultrasounds, they have all been an offshoot of the space program, of the defense technology and the space program. There is a lot the space program can do for upbringing the technology. The generation on a fast race compared to all you end up after sitting over there. Our day work starts from 9 to 6, but to bring the traffic and bandwidth uh, you know, potholes and other things, we have to do one hour early and one hour late. So we don't have the daily chain for taking care of our body. By the time we come back home, we'll be very tired. So weekends is not weekend. So can I do one hour of rigorous exercise in one day of the weekend and can it still be healthy or what uh, changes for us that you people suggest? Let me tell you one thing. There is something new. Let me tell you. I do one hundred and five, one hundred and fifty steps. One hundred and fifty steps. Okay. I. That what you do. I. 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 My regular program. I, you know, I'm ready to go out. I'm ready to go out. But I'm just telling you, when you do this every day, I'm sure we can guide you to your exercise to weekends. It has to be consistent five days a week, or at least three to four days a week. And that depends on what kind of rigorous exercise you are doing. Weekend exercise may not really want to do your regular exercise, but something to do job. You know, take it to the weekends and you are still able to make up uh, the rules where uh, you know, rest, throw out risk and uh, keep their uh, uh, risk factors down. It is all possible. But I am still recommend probably rather than pushing that to the weekend, why not do it more I do agree with, uh, very much with this. See, some exercises clear. Some of you know, I do one hundred and five, one hundred and fifty one hundred and fifty why don't we give you good news? Okay. I, that's what we do. I'm going to write a letter that, you know, I'm going to write a letter that, 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 when you do this a day, I am sure we can guide you to your conclusion of exercise to weekends. It has to be consistent five days a week, or at least three to four days a week. And that depends on what kind of rigorous exercise you are doing. We can decide you may not really want to do your regular exercise. But it's something to do job, you know, take care of the weekends, and you are still able to make up uh, the rules where, uh, you know, rest, throw out the risk, and keep their uh, uh, risk factors down. It is all possible. But I am still recommend probably rather than pushing that to the weekend, why not do it more consistent? I do agree with, uh, very much with this. See, some exercises clearly don't have uh, time to exercise and stand patiently on the ground floor waiting for the for three minutes. Enough of you to come and there is no time on floor or two floors. I never use the elevators in, in the hospital. Never, ever. And I manage 
about 20 floors every day. Every day during working because I don't find time to go for exercise. But I do that every day. You can park your, your car uh, 100 meters away from your normal slot. You can get down from the bus on one stop earlier. You can, instead of telling yourself to go and pick up the remote from the TV, go pick up the person, that much you want to do. I mean, this is what you find. Go to the other room, buy the groceries, no, you won't do that. You have to get somebody else to do it. It's just a few minutes. You can build that activity. When I get a few minutes free, I sometimes just for no reason go down to the ground floor and come out. And I do it, I do it very purposefully, looking as if I am going to see a patient. You could do the same. The American Diabetes Association has clearly said that you should not sit for more than half an hour at a time. Prolonged periods of sitting should be interrupted every half an hour with a brief period of exercise. That's what it says. However brief it is, just get up, pretend you are going to go to the toilet or going to get a cup of tea or water or whatever, in the next cubicle, do something. Don't sit for prolonged period. This is a major risk factor and I am sure with commitment you don't need the kind of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it, everyone can do it. Dr. Prakash actually reminds us of Virat Kohli, we see all those videos on the <laughs> So, I think mean, we have to observe in offices also, people talking about extension. Same floor, they can even walk 10 steps. So, the first thing should start in the office, people can actually walk and instead of talking over phone, they can walk and discuss the matter. No, there is not a problem, but we are standing in the university. I have a question for you, this come from the online audience, because uh, I from the online audience, what is the difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack? These are two relevant terms, but what does it mean for you? Cardiac arrest and heart attack, yes. Heart attack is the common man's terminology. Uh, used for myocardial infarction. The scientific name is myocardial infarction. And common man uses the word heart attack. There is a sudden cessation of the blood supply to a small portion of the heart when one of the arteries is blocked. The consequences of this are damage to the heart muscle. This is what is heart attack. Heart attack causes death. If, say, for example, uh, 100 people die of a heart attack, roughly with the present available technology, Roughly about 4% will die even after primary angioplasty, even after doing the best possible treatment in the hospital, there is a possibility of death to an extent of 4%. Before the onset, let me take you historically over time. In the, in the early 1970s, when CC was not there, if 100 people had a heart attack, the mortality was about 30%. With the introduction of the coronary care units, it reduced about 15%. With the introduction of the uh, thrombolytic agents, it reduced about 8%. With the introduction of primary PTC, it has reduced about 4%. So the treatment is evolved and has reduced. But in the world now, in the first few minutes, where they can develop the most people don't reach the hospital because of the electrical problems which the patient can develop and uh, electrophysiologist here and spoke about uh, sudden cardiac death. That, unless you reach the hospital, you can't do the treatment. So, uh, these days we see that in, 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 in foreign countries there are defibrillators yes. which are always in, in the malls and people are educated about how to use them and when to use them. So, this can go a long way in reducing the uh, mortality. So, my function is developing the process of blocking and consequences. And the other one is it's kind of heart, stop. heart stop. As a consequence of the insult to the heart, the heart stop working that is cardiac arrest. And it, could, it may not be only a uh, heart attack. There are the final common thing that is going to happen to all people who die is the heart is going to stop. Cardiac arrest can occur. It is going to occur any cause. That's the kind of common In simple terms, heart attack is myocardial infarction. Cardiac arrest is a complication of myocardial infarction. Heart attack people can be saved. Cardiac arrest, very few people can be saved. And cardiac arrest occurs because of many reasons, not just a heart attack. There are many reasons which lead to a cardiac arrest. And cardiac arrest is the ultimate thing. And Dr. Shetty put it, that's the final way the person will The heart just stops. So you really can't do much at that time. But for heart attack, we have definitely so many treatment options available. So, People need to understand that heart attack can be treated, 
Hare Krishna is probably cannot be I have a very funny question of this. So I was seeing a don't have a question for you this time from the on the minus uh from the minus difference between Kali and Arrest and Hara. These are two relevant terms. But what does it mean for you? Heart attack. Yes. Heart attack is the common man's terminology uh, used for myocardial infarction. The scientific name is myocardial infarction, and common man uses the word heart attack. There is a sudden cessation of the blood supply to a small portion of the heart when one of the arteries is blocked. The consequences of this are damage to the heart muscle. This is what is heart attack. Heart attack causes death. If say for example, uh, 100 people die of a heart attack, roughly with the present available technology, roughly about 4% will die even after primary angioplasty, even after doing the best possible treatment in the hospital, there is a possibility of death to an extent of 4%. Before hospital, let me take you historically over time. In the, in the early 1970s, when CC was not there, if 100 people die of heart attack, the mortality was about 30%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the introduction of the coronary care units, it reduced about 15%. Mm -hmm. With the introduction of the uh, translating agents, it reduced about 8%. Mm -hmm. With the introduction of primary PGC, it has reduced about 4%. So the treatment is evolved and has reduced. But in the world now, in the first few minutes, where they can develop the most people don't reach the hospital because of the electrical problems which the patient can have and the uh, electrical geologist here who spoke about the sudden cardiac death. That, unless you reach the hospital, you can't do treatment. So, uh, these days we see that in, in, in foreign countries there are defibrillators which are arrived in, in the malls and people are educated about how to use them and when to use them. So, this can go a long way in reducing the uh, mortality. So, my family function is developing the process of blocking and consequences. And the other one is physical okay. exercise and heart stopping. As a consequence of the insult to the heart, the heart stops working, that is cardiac arrest. And it, could, it may not be only a uh, heart attack. There are the final common thing that is going to happen to all people who die is the heart is going to stop. Cardiac arrest can occur. In the case of any cause, that's the final common in simple terms, heart attack is myocardial infarction. Cardiac arrest is a complication of myocardial infarction. Heart attack people can be saved. Cardiac arrest, very few people can be saved. And cardiac arrest occurs because of many reasons, not just a heart attack. There are many reasons which lead to a cardiac arrest. And cardiac arrest is the ultimate thing. And Dr. Shelley put it, that's the final way the person becomes. The heart just stops. So you really can't do much at that time. But for heart attack, we have definitely so many treatment options out there. So, people need to understand that heart attack can be treated, cardiac arrest is probably cannot be treated. I have a very funny question on this. So, I was seeing a don't have a question for you this time from the online audience. Uh, I think you have heard from the online What is the difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack? These are two relevant terms. But what does it mean for you? Cardiac arrest and heart attack. Yes. Heart attack is the common man's terminology uh, used for myocardial infarction. The scientific name is myocardial infarction. And common man uses the word heart attack. There is a sudden cessation of the blood supply to a small portion of the heart when one of the arteries is blocked. The consequences of this are damage to the heart muscle. This is what is heart attack. Heart attack causes death. If say for example, uh, 100 people die of a heart attack, roughly with the present available technology, roughly about 4% will die even after primary angioplasty, even after doing the best possible treatment in the hospital, there is a possibility of death to an extent of 4%. Before hospital, let me take you historically over time. In the, in the early 1970s, when CC was not there, if 100 people died of heart attack, the mortality was about 30%. Mm -hmm. With the Mm -hmm. Introduction of the coronary care units, it reduced about 15%. Mm -hmm. With the introduction of the uh, translating agents, it reduced about 8%. With the introduction of 
and the PCC has reduced to about 4%. So the treatment is evolved and has reduced. But in the way they have, in the first few minutes, where they can develop the most people don't reach the hospital because of the electrical problems which the patient can develop. And uh, electrophysiologist here and spoke about the sudden cardiac death. That, unless you reach the hospital, you can't do the treatment. So uh, these days we see that in, 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 in foreign countries there are defibrillators which are available in, in the malls and people are educated about how to use them and when to use them. So this can go a long way in reducing the uh, mortality. So myocardial infarction is developed in the process of blocking and consequences. And the other one is physical okay. okay. right? heart stop. As a consequence of the insult to the heart, the heart stops working that is right. And it, could, it may not be only a uh, heart attack. There are the final common thing that is going to happen to all people who die is the heart is going to stop. I guess can occur. It is a real any cause. That's the final common thing. In simple terms, heart attack is myocardial infarction. Cardiac arrest is a complication of myocardial infarction. Heart attack people can be saved. Cardiac arrest, very few people can be saved. And cardiac arrest occurs because of many reasons, not just a heart attack. There are many reasons which lead to a cardiac arrest. And cardiac arrest is the ultimate thing. As Dr. Shetty put it, that's the final way the person is The heart just stops. So you really can't do much at that time. But for heart attack, we have definitely so many treatment options out there. So, people need to understand that heart attack can be treated, cardiac arrest is probably cannot be treated. I have a very funny question on this. So, are we seeing a day? No. It does not happen there in the West, no. no. So, I don't think it is going to happen in India. Mainly because, first of all, our awareness levels are still very, very, very low. We have to make sure people do not waste it. See, we have simple devices like glucose monitoring device, blood pressure monitoring devices, and even those are not being commonly used for most of our patients. Though we suggest and recommend it. So, I do not see a way that ADs are going to be kept at home with this. The more I would like to see is at least ADs being available in public transport systems public places like malls and railway stations and airports. And people being taught about it, people being made aware of it. Most of the people do not, do not have any idea about the basic rights of the are any kind of training is not there. So I think that needs to happen first before we start talking about the ADC that and railroads. Not at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank all the experts, Dr. Kukar, Dr. Mujita, Dr. Gordon, Dr. Gordon, Dr. Shetty. Excellent, we have an excellent discussion encompassing all aspects, uh, I think most of the aspects of heart disease, heart attacks, prevention, treatment, and even the involved in the diabetes bit as well. So, I would like to thank uh, the audience who spoke over here. I would like to thank the <laughs> to all more programs in Bangalore. Probably, Bangalore has been the IT capital of India. Maybe it will lead the way to prevent more heart attacks and healthy heart lifestyle. Thank you everybody. Thank you for your presence.